Welcome to the Gauntlet Podcast. This is Lowell, and this is part of our monthly interview series with uh, important RPG people and thinkers and doers. And today we have with us Pam Alexander, who is the lead designer for Evil Hat's forthcoming Dresden Files Accelerated. I've had a chance to, to look at it. I've had a chance to run it. If you go online, you can find videos of the, the Gauntlet playing it. I really dig it. Uh, so, Pam, I want to thank you for taking the time to to talk with us today. Well, thank you for the for the invitation. I really appreciate that. And let me go back a little bit. And what was your first encounter with fate itself? Okay, so um, just before we get started, let me let me correct a little bit to say that I was the lead author. Oh, the lead okay. Des- the lead designer is actually um, Leonard Balsera. Okay. And Lenny has a very long lineage, no pun intended, of working on, on Fate and Dresden. So, And we worked in collaboration uh, very, very closely. So my first, my first encounter with Fate really was dealing with the Dresden Files it's actually kind of an interesting story because I didn't even know that the the game existed, but in 2010, I want to say it was, I first worked with Jim Butcher at, as his handler at a convention. And he introduced me to this gentleman named Fred Hicks. And they had a copy of the role-playing guide there. And so I went out and bought it, got them to sign it, started hanging out a little bit more on social media with Fred and those guys and became more interested in, in fate as, as time progressed to the point where I got to know most of the people that, that were the sort of movers and shakers in the Dresden world for evil hat. But the interesting thing is I didn't really, I didn't play fate until I want to say 2015. Mm -hmm. I think that was the first time I actually played it. So it was, it was an awareness that began a number of years ago, but, uh, really a, a front on experience didn't happen until a few years back. Now, had you been playing RPGs then before that, or was, was fate some of the introduction? How did that work for you? I don't want to really discuss my age, but my That's first introduction enough. to <laughs> my first introduction to RPGs was through a boyfriend in college who had this thing called Dungeons and dragons i think cool. it was. obscure obscure a little obscure game and he he tried really hard to get me to understand what was going on there and i didn't really kind of it didn't really click with me until a few years later so i had a long period in my uh my 20s and 30s of playing rpgs mostly the champion system and dungeons and dragons but my husband who is a just died in the wool gamer loves game systems collects game systems he got me back into playing on a more routine basis. So of of the last several years, we have been doing a lot of, well, we started off with Pathfinder because that was the group that we could find locally. But I don't know if you've heard of this, this, this group online called Gauntlet. Yes, yes. But <laughs> that has really introduced us to a lot more of the indie games. And he and I are very big fans of Powered by the Apocalypse. So we have been we have been fiddling around with an awful lot of games over the past few years and that's brilliant because it keeps me both in touch with what's going on as far as the game world is concerned and also it's just flat fun Mm -hmm. now you as i understand it you you're a big fan of dungeon world you played a lot of that right Mm -hmm. yes so let's stick on sort of the mechanical side Uh, now you've played fate you've played dungeon world if you were to talk to somebody who maybe hadn't encountered them, how would you describe sort of what the, the the differences are, what the philosophical approach differences are between those? Between Dungeon World and uh, Fate? Fate fantasy of some kind. Or Dresden Fate Accelerator. Oh, that's a good point. That's a good point. Uh, uh, well, let me think how I want to put this. Well, let's say... Uh, what, what do you suppose is the closest thing to to Dresden Files Accelerated in the PBTA universe? Is that Monster of the Week? I, I actually have not played Monster of the Week. Okay. And it's kind of sad for me because I know okay. that a lot of people love it. But uh, I have played in at least a couple of, of Urban Shadows games. Okay. And if you're looking at something that's more uh, analogous to 
to Dresden, I'd say that, that those things feel right. In fact, I know that some people have, have before the, the advent of DIFA has allowed people to use the actual system since the, the, the preview came out and everything that people have been using urban shadows to you know, basically run a Dresden game. So I would say that that is kind of in the right direction, but even okay. so, because of the way that, because of the way that, that Lenny and Clark Valentine and the, the other designers decided to structure the game system, mm-hmm. the philosophically, they're, they're really not that, they're really not that close because the way that, that I think the way that the mantles work in Dresden Files Accelerated versus the way that the playbooks work in the Powered by the Apocalypse systems. The mantles allow, I think, a little bit more flexibility. Uh, the whole idea behind a playbook is sort of to say, this is what you can do. This is what you might be able to do down the road. And you're kind of, you're, you're kind of locked into, uh, I think, uh, laterally speaking, you're kind of locked into what you're going to play. But the the mantles that are basically synonymous with playbooks for people that do the the Power by the Apocalypse kind of games. The 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 biggest difference is that the mantles for DIFA they actually recommend or not recommend, but they we we include examples of how to mix them. Uh, I know that there's a couple of spots where it says okay for a playbook it says okay in advancement you can take a, a couple of stunt um skills from one of the other mantle uh playbooks excuse me uh but it still kind of wants you to stick within your main group of of skills and as far as the dresden files accelerated system is concerned because there are a number of characters in dresden files that could basically apply to different mantles or have multiple mantles that there's this inherent flexibility to to combine things and there's a lot of information that was included about how just to do that and i really like that about the way that the the game system for dresden works is that it it it, it has a lot of flexibility to kind of make your own playbook within the system Mm-hmm. to make your own mantle within the system or you know, to make your own combination mantle within the system versus some of the some of the player made i think playbooks that i've seen through urban shadows and some of the other skinned power by the apocalypse games they they may do well but they they may not quite get there so i like the fact that the tools are more geared toward flexibility for uh, Difa. That kind of went askew from what you were asking me as far as similarities are concerned, but I'm pretty sure that that is something that happens in these kinds of conversations. Oh, absolutely. So. <laughs> uh, now, the the mantles are are very interesting to me as as a person who who really digs fate in that they do seem to move away from the very kind of tight logic of stunts, and mm-hmm. they they open things up in a, in a very different way than than a lot of the other things. And it feels like this is almost sort of the, the next gen of people doing work with, with fate that, mm-hmm. that it opens up a lot of, a lot of territory there. No, it really does. And part of the reason why I think that this happened was that a couple of years back, the evil hat brain trust created this sort of tight version of, of fate core called fate accelerated and that was the genesis of what became dresden files accelerated and the system is so much more approachable that people that found the intricacies of fate to be challenging especially newer people people who are newer to the gaming world they they didn't find that to be an issue anymore at all they could take the that that lightweight framework and start playing with it and it was used in schools uh, Mm. as teaching tools which is really super cool and you should hear uh, clark valentine and brian angard and lenny balsera talk about that because i I think fred's even addressed it some it's it's fascinating and i i like that fact because 
what they tried to do with Dresden Files Accelerated was to take the framework that had been built for in the <clears throat> original RPG, apply it to, or rather apply the new lighter weight mechanisms for the accelerated version and come up with this much more approachable set that allows people to be more creative with how they want to establish setting, how they want to establish factions, uh, how they want to do anything. And, and it's, it, it worked out really well, I think, because like you said, it's, it seems to be a lot more flexible without locking you into, into stunts. The idea is that you will be able to take the information that's there and use it to create the general mechanism that you want to use in something that's not in the book. For example, uh, magic items. Like it just says, you know, we don't want to weigh you down with, with rules about how to do it. These, these are a few examples about how magic items are used. Let me, let me kind of step off from, from what you've said there about the, the mantles and, and the mm-hmm. opening. Uh, because one of the interesting things is I was going through all of the, the worlds of adventure mm-hmm. and it does seem to me that there is, there is a trend among those in simplifying the skill sets and simplifying some of the really base mechanics. And, and that's kind of nice to, to reduce those, to reduce the cognitive weight of that, to put more emphasis on elements like the mantles that are mm-hmm. setting specific that, that do those things. So I think that's, that's really neat. Let me actually swing back to the idea of, of you coming on to the, the the project and and the yeah. whole authorship. So at, at what point did you come on at the uh, inception or, or can you tell us about how that came about? Sure. That actually is I'd like to to bring this up to anybody who's listening because it's a it's a story of how people who are related to a particular project or a com a set of content if you're persistent and you're willing to work for uh, free just doing whatever it is that needs to happen get involved with a project the the the, the bigger stuff will come along later um, volunteer and be and be uh, engaged and be willing to to do what needs to be done and the reason why I say that is I don't think it's much of a secret that to most people that I'm good friends with Jim butcher that was not why I became involved with evil hats um production team and not why i started working on paranet papers which was the third volume in the original dress and files rpg i knew the material super well because oddly enough i had been involved in a job for four years that that um, I had been in a job for four years that involved me commuting for an hour and a half to two hours every day. Hmm. And I listened constantly to the audiobooks because I found James Marster's voice to be super soothing. I love the way that Jim writes. And it's it, it was just entertaining. And because I got so entrenched in that, and I kept up my friendship with some of the people from Evil Hat, I got kind of volunteered to be a, or, or I volunteered. I don't remember if I did it or someone else did it, but anyways, <laughs> I got I, I got involved in being basically a um, a beta reader for Paradet Papers, which I think was back in 2014 and maybe 2013, probably 2013. If that t- tells you how long it takes to get one of the Dresden Files products actually out the door, because oh wow, there's there's so much yeah there's so much material that goes into each of these these productions and. Jim's world is to, to people who are fans of urban fantasy in general, uh, but in his stuff in specific, it's sort of like the, it's sort of like the Star Trek of urban fantasy, which is to say people are absolutely entrenched and, and they're so familiar with the world that you want to make sure that everything is right. So they brought me on as an, as a, as a, a consultant and just as a beta reader. And I ended up, doing so much work that I got credit later on for being one of the contributing writers. Oh, awesome. And, and yeah, and yeah, my name's in the, the credits for, for Paranet Papers. And that was one of my proudest moments, but because of the amount of work that I did on that particular, that work, 
when the Dresden Files Accelerated uh, became a Kickstarter goal for getting Fake Core written, which was, I don't remember, it was ridiculously successful. Yeah. A ridiculously successful Kickstarter, but it was the last, it was the last Kickstarter goal. And when they actually got it and decided to produce it, one of the production people, I don't remember who exactly it was, reached out and said that they wanted me to be the lead author on it. And that's, so that's kind of, uh, long story short, that's kind of how I got involved in being an author for Evil Hat and, and basically being one of the lead writers for anything that is that is Dresden. Well, it, Paranet Papers is, when I look through that, it is monumental. But there's so much stuff in there. There's so much detail. There's so many moving parts in that. Mm-hmm. It is an amazing book and, and just huge. So the 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 review and and reading process i i can't even imagine how long that would have just crazy it was really a a super big project to work on not just because we were catching up on the dresden canon from i want to say it was small favor which is book 10 i think is where the the first set of books ended and this one carried through uh, pretty much, I think the middle of book thirteen. Mm-hmm. So, so we had a, a chunk of, and a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff happened in Harry Dresden's world in those in those books. So we had a lot of stuff to catch up on. But also, there were so many people that worked on that book over the course of the development time that there was a fatigue about it. So uh-huh. when I when I kind of wrapped my arms around it, it was with the the help of the very talented uh editor that we have at Evil Hat for for that stuff which is Amanda Valentine and oh, yeah. and some other people we actually were able to wrestle it down because you're talking about I think they had like 8 to 10 people who actually wrote content for it so it was just a beast to get everything into the point where it sounded like it was coming from one person and it sounded like something that would be a an artifact of the Dresden world. So I I I'm, am in sheer admiration for the amount of work that Amanda did, that all the people that contributed, Clark, Valentine, her husband, and Lenny Balsera, who wrote that fantastic chapter on Las Vegas at the beginning. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And all all the other people, the, the amount of work that they and effort they put into making that that book is amazing. But it also served to be a really good basis for when I started working on the the settings and organization for uh, DIFA, it, it it was a really good foundation. I mean, the work that I did on on Paranet Papers was a tremendous help, of course, already because I got to to work with the team and know what things were going to be like, but also because they had established a good foundational structure for how things should be uh things should progress we we knew a lot more and were able to get and i know it doesn't sound like it happened but we were able to get parent or uh sorry we were able to get uh, difa out the door with relative speed for for this type of project because we had that experience right behind us yeah i think one of the things is is when i first saw difa defe however mm-hmm. <laughs> i was expecting it to be a very slight thing but that's it's a it is a solid hefty book it is a solid hefty supplement with yeah i just want to say that yeah it's um i i want to say it's it's 250 ish pages Mm -hmm. and that was i think the goal that we were sort of reaching for we had initially started to to want to back down on our word count Uh, it was a lower word count but also we wanted to make sure that we did a thorough job of explaining the accelerated system so i think at some point we realized that in order to get the mantles which was and that the mantles were an effect of our first play test because uh we had done things completely differently in the early versions of oh. this particular game okay. so the the play tests got us to where the mantles are and that made us realize that things needed to be a little bit more substantial than we had initially expected them to be so it, yeah it's it's quite the it's quite the volume and i i can't wait to see it in hard copy i mean i've 
seen it in PDF for quite some time, but uh, I'm looking forward to seeing the hard copy. I do want to say, though, you, you said a minute ago that it's um, a, a supplement. It really isn't. No, it's no. It's its own I, yeah. system. Yeah, it's a it's misstatement its on my part. Yeah. Uh, so where did Man- – you, you mentioned that they started in a different place in terms of, mm-hmm. of the, the thinking. Where had they, they started with? What would have been the original initial approach? I'm trying to remember exactly what we were call what we were calling the, but it was weight classes for the most part. That's something that that's a term that Jim uses a great deal to discuss the various and sundry supernatural characters in his world. Is that that he puts, um, uh, let's say he puts the the fairy queens in one weight class, and then he puts the senior council of the white council of wizards. He puts them in a class below that, and then he may put um, let's say fairy fey lords and um, some certain supernatural creatures from the never never. He will put them below that. So weight classes is something that we had sort of said. Okay, this is Jim's term. This is something that we want to work with, and and we never really got it to where it made sense. I think to anybody outside of our group and our development team. I mean, we all sat and huddled a great deal <laughs> discussing what had happened with the, the, the beta test, or I guess I would like to refer to it as the alpha test uh-huh. because we had a second beta. So it's really an alpha test. And we said, this just needs, it's not really resonating with people. Let's see what else needs to happen. And um, Lenny and Clark came up with the whole uh, mantle structure in part because that seemed to be the direction that that seemed to the whole the whole self-contained character structure thing seemed to be the way that that indie game systems were going uh, mainly because of power by the apocalypse but it mm-hmm. it harkened back really strongly to to me at least to the way that the, the initial you know warrior mage pre uh not priest uh, right. monk no not even monk it was warrior pre- cleric. It was warrior mage cleric thank you and uh, Ranger, those guys, right? It uh, and Rogue. It, it it harkened back to the original, like the basic set, because it's like, look, here's what you can play, and here's all the things that you need to know about what you can play. And if you want to do some other things, here's some 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 some, some rules that will make it easier for you to to figure out where you want to go with the character. But realistically, this is this is where we are. And mantles of power are something that are also things that Jim mentions in his books. Um, and it's becoming more and more clear as the book series progresses. For me, one of the things I think the smart decision that you've got there that, that struck me is how you do have the concept of scale and this concept of mantles separate mm-hmm. to, to, to give the, the GMs and the players some flexibility with that. Yep. It, it, it's a, it's, it feels really good in play. Yeah, I, I've had I've had by the way a good time watching you guys um, in your um, YouTube videos of <laughs> of play and stuff. I need to finish the last two, but yeah, it's been kind of interesting seeing all that take to action. And one of the things I love about it is that, again, as somebody who's not a Dresden first aficionado, given the deface materials, I was able to to run from that and have it feel feel good and and work. So. I think that's, that's brilliant. Credit to you guys to have, well, thank to have you. enough presentation that that it it holds up. Thank you. That's that was and I and I love the fact that you were one of the people that absolutely took the the first well it wasn't the first look one but you you took the the preview download and ran with it knowing that you've only read a, a handful of the books uh, and knowing that it's not necessarily the medium that you would use or the setting I should say that you would mm-hmm. use, but you, you were able to take it and run with it. And that's, that's kind of the sweet spot that we were trying to hit with Dresden files accelerated, which is the first game is it's so beautifully done and it's so much fun to read, but let's face it. If you're not a gamer, you're a fan of the, of the books, but you're not a gamer that much weight. I mean, literal weight because those three books are oh, heavy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> The, the literal weight of all of that structure is going to be imposing and intimidating to somebody who loves the, the books, but not necessarily, you know, is familiar with the games. And so we wanted to, to do a, 
a more streamlined version of the system for those people, for the people that want to play in, in the Dresden verse, but don't want to, you know, that don't have the experience or don't want to get involved with that much as far as, as far as rules are concerned. It's very crunchy, the first mm -hmm. one. However, we also didn't want to turn off the people like you who might be interested in an urban fantasy sort of setting and an urban fantasy system without knowing an awful lot about it. Like we didn't want you to have to go and read 15 books. You know, it's like here, you can, you can use the system, but you have to read all of Jim's Dresden Files novels and, and the short stories and the comic books. So we didn't want to have to make, make you do that. So I, I, I like the fact that you are speaking to that one area that we were really trying to hit, which is it, it meeting the needs of, of both groups. Uh, and I think if I remember correctly, only one of your players had read Dresden before? I think that is true. One was a strong aficionado, and I think all the rest were, were like myself, or novices. Mm -hmm. Had maybe seen the TV show or read a couple of the books, or mm -hmm. at least knew what it was. So, yeah, that's cool. I, I really like that fact. So yeah. I'm glad you brought that up. Now, at the start, when, when I uh, introduced you, you made a distinction between your role as, as lead author versus mm -hmm. lead designer. Can you talk about what the distinction is, what that, what that means in terms of the project? Um, absolutely. And thank you. That's something that I, I would really enjoy sort of, of strengthening because I don't want to come off as being a, a game system guru. I'm not, and uh, I never have been. For me, rules have always been the sort of thing that exist in, in gaming to make it easier for you to tell the story. And so I always relied on people with me to say, no, 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 this is you roll, this is what you roll here and this is why you're rolling here. And this is where you want to roll high and this is where you want to roll low. And I'm like, okay. So I have become, because I've worked so closely with the material, I've become very familiar with the way that the Dresden Files rules systems are created and, and structured, but it's not my area of, of expertise. The way that, that this particular book was, or this particular game system, I should say, was, was created, and the way that it has, especially since Paranet Papers and now Dresden Files Accelerated, the way that they have come to exist is that you have two separate entities really working on it. Uh, you have people that know the game system and, and they also know the game really well or the, mm -hmm. the world really well. They know the Dresden first stuff, whether it was from reading the novels or just from working on the first game system really well. But you've got the people that, that know the, the system, but then you've got people whose job it is to make it sound like it comes from Jim's world. And there are, I can't say that. I was going to say there are very few people that it's one of the things that I think that I do well as a writer is to match the style of somebody that I am trying to imitate. And this started when I was in college because I could, I could spout Shakespeare like Shakespeare wrote it. And people couldn't really tell the difference between what I'd said and what, what the Bard had said. I, I, I can't really, I don't know that I necessarily am that great a writer on my own, but I can imitate people. Uh, it's sort of the way that Hugh Jackman says he doesn't know how to sing but he knows how to sing like people who sing well. So that's the way he's, that's the way he learned how to sing. People are like, you have a beautiful voice. He went, no, I don't really have a beautiful voice. I'm imitating the people that do. So I don't know that I have, you know, talent wise. I don't know what's my talent or what's really just making up, you know, versions of what other people's stuff is. So, but my, to, to bring us back to where I'd started from for Difa, the reason why they brought me on board was because one, I had the, deep knowledge of the game setting and this is not the only project for Dresden Files that I work on I'm one of Jim's which I don't mention that much but I'm one of Jim's beta readers mm. and uh, not just for his novels but also for his comic books and so I I know not only his world but also I know his his voice really well so there was that but also the the fact that I knew I knew how to translate that information into words that sound like something that would come from him and his world. So that's why they brought me on as settings writer 
is that I could I could take the information that we wanted to present, meld it with my knowledge of Jim and Jim Jim's world and Jim's voice, and create something that sounds like an artifact of the Dresden world to begin with. And that's sort of the whole point is to give it that that flavor. One of the reasons why they brought me on board for this book was because for Paranet Papers, it, I became uh, what was called, I think, a, a voice editor because I was looking to make everything sound a little bit more like the characters in the book. And for this one, they had a brand new voice, which is it's Ivy. The archive is the one that's that's the author of this particular book. And they'd never used Ivy before. So they, I think they also wanted a fresh voice to come out and say, you know, this is what Ivy will sound like, which I might note as an aside, that's a huge challenge and scared the bejeebus out of me yeah. when I was first starting to work on it. Because you have this character who's never been heard from outside of the Dresden uh, Files novels before, who is a, at this at the point where we started writing the books, a teenager, teenage girl, who has the full knowledge of the world and the world's history, the history of mankind, in her brain. So it's trying to figure out how to write from the perspective of someone who knows literally everything that's ever been written down. It's, it, it, was, it was a little scary. <laughs> but anyways, so that's why they have me do that stuff, is because uh, of the settings and all of that. Now, one of the interesting things is, and this is sometimes a risky thing in RPGs, is you carry that voice through not just in the sort of the, the history and discussion section, is is we get that voice in the rules and the mechanical sections. Um, now, I've seen that done with other games where it doesn't work because that voice interferes with that. And that's certainly not the case here. What was that like trying to massage the rules to get that voice? Fortunately, uh, you have, and I keep bringing Lenny up, but, but mm -hmm. he's, Leonard Balsera is, is the creative director for the project for a lot of, of really good reasons. And not the least of which is the fact he's, he's a darn fine writer. He's a darn fine game designer, but he also is somebody that knows the world well enough to be at least, at least consistent enough to make the, the biggest things that I would have to do, I think is maybe tweak a little bit. Mm -hmm. As far as his his work is concerned, it, that was was effortless. Our newer writers, Morgan Ellis was one of the ones that worked on this, and I think uh, Richard Bellingham and Ed Turner, all of those guys helped write the rules, and all of them, to some degree, did a pretty decent job of making it sound like um, Ivy and making it sound like. Kincaid, the the person who kibitzes with Ivy in the in the margins, so that my job was really just to go in and and make everything sound a little bit more smoothly from one voice. So it really wasn't as challenging as it might have been without the dedication and just utmost amazing talent from Lenny and his team to make sure that they they at least got us on base. I think all I did was was to to bunt us bunt the lead runner home. We'll say <laughs> to use a baseball analogy. Well, that Rich will appreciate the the sports ball analogy there. So <laughs> let me ask you then. Uh, you've mentioned the 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 play testing process, the alpha uh -huh. and beta process. Can you talk about your perspective on that and how that was structured? I know a lot. Of, we have a lot of designers in the gauntlet who are doing things and and. I'm always curious about how that works. I think I wrote in the foreword a thank you to the the testers because I, for one thing, without as I mentioned earlier, without the alpha testers, we would not have gotten the product that we had. We pretty much retooled the system after that. So there there's no way that you can overstate their impact on the game. As far as the betas are concerned, the people that did the, the, the last one, which I think was at the end of 2015, mm -hmm. uh, I collated all of the information, all the surveys. If people think that the surveys aren't used, they are. 
to exhaustive detail and and wrote up summaries and, and all that sort of thing. Chapter 13 of Dresden Files Accelerated came specifically from the, the beta testing because they had mentioned, everybody had mentioned different settings that they were interested in. And uh, the one theme that we kept seeing was New Orleans. And I went, well, you know, the vast majority, if you're looking at, at if you're looking at the, the settings that people use for their testing, the, the largest number by far, it was not Chicago, which surprised me. Mm-hmm. It was New Orleans. So I said, okay, well, let's do something with New Orleans there. So you can see the effect. My point is you can see the effect throughout the book of what our beta readers, or not beta readers, our beta testers did and what they what their feedback. Uh, came to um, the way some of the mantles were restructured uh, after the testing, the way we actually included a mantle for a couple of different archetypes after uh, the tester said, we, we need to see this, we need to see that. So I, I can't emphasize enough the importance of giving yourself at least one, but better still two play tests as much as you, as, as much as you can to as wide an audience as you can to be able to fully execute a product that will um, apply to the people that you expect to play it. It's, it's all fun and games and fine if you want to write a system that makes sense to you, but only through play testing will you get to see what the people that will actually be your end product users are going to want to see and, and do. You just, you come up with a much, much stronger product because you've had it tested and, and you have to listen to what they say. Some of it is not good. Some of it might hurt, but it's all going to be information that you can use to, to make your product better. And in the end, that's what everybody wants. You want to be able to produce the thing that shines the most, the thing that works the best. Certainly looking at it, I can see that there's some significant differences between the, the earlier ritual magic system and the one that we get, you know, in the end, Yes. Uh, Lenny uh, actually that, rewrote that whole thing yeah, after, it, after the test. Yeah. So you talked about having co- collated the, the information about this. Like, what would you say? I mean, if you were to go, okay, this is the most useful kind of playback, uh, play test feedback. What, what would you say are the kinds of useful approaches or things when you're getting feedback from people? For, for my side of the world, I was looking for them uh, for information that said, does this sound like, it came. It came from Jim's world. The, it, it, does it sound like uh, the archive said it? And I've heard ever since that people thought Jim wrote it, which is about the best thing that you can hear. Uh-huh. And it still blows my mind that people say that. From a game setting perspective, which is probably more in line of what you, uh, you and and some of the the podcast listeners would want to hear about, I would say that you want to hear where you have gaps in your rules you want to hear about like like ritual magic made no sense to so many people and as a result of that lenny and um i think it was pretty much lenny because he sort of took it on himself with a lot of caffeine i think to just gut through a complete a complete rewrite of it over the weekend and it was amazing Mm -hmm. and but you need to find out where where there are gaps and and You need people to tell you where some rules don't make sense and you need to find out where there is any conflicts because let's face it, no one's going to, no one's going to barf out one of these things overnight. It's going to be a long, arduous process of creating your system. And as you progress, and I know this is a writer Mm -hmm. as, as, as a, as a story progresses, as a novel progresses, you're going to change some things without really realizing that you're, you know, contradicting what you've done earlier. And that's one of the places where it's really important for beta testers to say, Hey, this, that's not the, this mechanic here isn't the way it worked over here. So we need, you know, anything as far as the rules themselves are concerned with, with gaps, with conflicts, with um, confusion that, that needs to be brought up. But I'd also say that people, People really help us when they say, this is how we took the rules and applied it. This is what we did that made sense. And this is what we enjoyed. 
Mm-hmm. Like you want both sides of the feed. You want both constructive and positive feedback because you want to know what you need to, to retool. And you also need to know what you need to leave the heck alone. <laughs> so, um, because it, it comes a point where you're just like, okay, well, let me just throw everything out. Like, well, don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. There's going to be some good things in there too, that you want to make sure that you keep. Uh, I would also like to add, which is not necessarily part of your question, but we looked for a wide scale of testers, people who knew Jim's world, people who didn't know Jim's world, people who were very familiar with gaming, people who weren't so familiar with gaming, first time game masters, uh, very experienced game masters. So it's like you want, to, if you if you get that variety in your in your testing, you'll get a much clearer picture of the sort of effect your your game system has uh, created in its users. Yeah, I, I, I want to come back and, and reinforce one of the points you made that I think is so important that that getting positive feedback in a, in a critical uh, way is to know what has worked. Having, mm-hmm. having worked with editors before and some who don't know that lesson, you have to give your, your people some solid ground and tell them what they don't need to be retooling. Mm-hmm. This episode of the Gauntlet Podcast is brought to you by Nocturnal Media and their game King Arthur Pendragon. Relive the grandeur, romance, and adventure of the greatest of all legends, the story of King Arthur. Assume the role of a knight starting his career in the time of Uther Pendragon, undertaking quests and perilous adventures for your lord, for your lady love, for the church, or for your own glory. Win great renown with your laudable deeds and feats of arms, perhaps even winning the right to carve your name into the round table itself, as the story of Arthur and Camelot unfolds around you. With its innovative rules, including the distinctive traits and passions system designed to help you in determining your character's behavior under any circumstances, King Arthur Pendragon provides a unique role-playing experience laid out against the richest tapestry in Western literature. Nocturnal Media's Edition 5.2 updates the redesigned and reorganized 5th edition. This book also contains new material and rules changes for 5th edition by Greg Stafford, the creator of the original game. Thanks again to Nocturnal Media for supporting the Gauntlet Podcast. Uh, well, we're coming towards the, to the end here, so let me ask you what, what you're working on now, or what you'd like to be working on, or what, what's sort of the, the in the future for you here. Well, right now I am, I don't want to say I'm not doing anything, but I'm actually, my contract at work ended, so I'm I'm not working. So yeah, so right now uh, I'm working on, um, I joined the creative team to be a consultant for Jim's uh, comic book series. And that's been really fun because I first cut my teeth in the, I don't want to say the geek world, but Mm -hmm. the game, the gaming comic book, graphic novel, blah, 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 publishing world uh, with with writing comic books. Now, I never unfortunately got anything published, but I had some stuff in development. And so this it's nice to be able to make full circle back to come back to that. As far as as far as gaming is concerned, uh, I don't actually think that we have anything on the agenda as far as another release of Dresden Files in the RPG world is concerned. Mm-hmm. We, of course, have the cooperative card game that Eric Vogel worked on, and that is going to be, and this is going to be news to, I, I don't think it's been released anywhere, so this will be news to the people that listen to the podcast. The game is going to come out the same time as the print version of Dresden Files Accelerated, which is June 15th. Mm, awesome. So it will be at Origins, and we will be there with a presence, a pretty strong presence for Origins, I think, uh, which is my favorite my favorite gaming convention to release both of those things into the wild. So anyways, right now, as far as evil hat is concerned, to my knowledge, uh, things are, are kind of quiet on the Dresden front. So I am actually turning my attention more toward my own work. Mm -hmm. And that is going to be in, in I'm working on a post-apocalyptic world right now uh, that is involved in, what happens in the United States after the uh, polar cats melt. Mm-hmm. 
Oh. So since I consider that to be at this point almost an inevitable. <laughs> so <laughs> thanks for yep. the environmental uh, thanks for the environmental mess up there guys. So anyways, uh so that's what I'm working on creatively right now. Uh I will be at Origins to help people who are interested in learning more about uh, the Dresden Files Accelerated System, and pe- I'm going to be helping with character creation. I'll be on staff for about four hours a day, I think, each day. And after that, as you all know, <laughs> I will be basically I'll be in games on demand. Awesome. And I'm hoping I know that some of our people are going to be running. Oh, good. Uh, some of the games. So I know that there's going to be at least two different people that are running Dresden Files Accelerated in games on demand. So basically between those two people, those two people, those two places, people will be able to find um, most of the people that worked on Dresden Files Accelerated and we'll be able to, to help see the fruition in person of our, you know, three years of effort. That's great. I'm I'm really glad to hear that people are going to be uh, taking it to games on demand. That's mm-hmm. that's really smart. Well, we're we're all games on demand geeks. I mean, yes. <laughs> uh, Sean Nittner, who's our absolutely glorious production manager, and I love to pieces and back again is is again he'll he'll be running games on demand um, and be participating in them. I know that you'll be there. I know that, that Rich will be there. It's really, and and I would say this directly to the people that participate with the gauntlet it is what we consider to be our home gaming group Mm -hmm. is the gauntlet is the gauntlet community and and that's mainly because we went to origins and gen con and met so many wonderful people through games on demand it's it's just the best thing to go in and try new things and meet new people and see what is to your taste before you actually commit to to anything campaign wise uh once you're home Absolutely. So, love it to pieces. Well, Pam, I'm going to I'm going to go to the the wrap up. Thank you listeners for uh tuning in to the Gauntlet podcast. Uh you can find out more about the Gauntlet at gauntlet-rpg.com. We've got links there to our various podcasts, Discern Realities, Comic Strip AP, Plus One Forward. You can also subscribe and comment uh on iTunes or your subscription uh service of choice because I know there are a bunch of them. Also, we've got a YouTube channel. On there, you can find various actual play videos, including our actual play for uh, DeFay. And uh, you can also find the podcast done in video format in case you prefer to, to use that on your device. Uh, finally, we also have a Patreon uh, to support the Gauntlet, and that's at patreon.com backslash gauntlet. Pam, thank you again for taking the time to do this. Uh, much appreciated. Is there anything else you want to want to pitch, or where can we find you? Uh, well, I have created a standalone Twitter account. Um, I know most people know me through Jedi Tigger, which is my uh, nickname because of my tattoo. But uh, I also I have a, a, a new standalone account now that's on Twitter that's called Literary Panda. And people are more than welcome to reach out to me there. As I said, I'm going to be at Origins. I will be, I don't know if this is going to come out in time, but next week I'll be at Phoenix Comic Con. And I'll be there with Jim. So uh, if anybody wants to come up and say hi, if anybody has any questions or whatnot, I absolutely welcome it. And I, I cannot thank you and the Gauntlet community enough for the amount of support that uh, I've been lucky enough to receive over the past uh, few years. Awesome. Thanks so much. Thank you. Mm-hmm.